All right, hello everybody. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Christine Liu. I use she and her pronouns, and I'm here to tell you not about my research, which is very new for me. I'm here to tell you about what I love to do outside of my research, and that is to communicate science using art. So um, it's funny that this panel uses the word novel for the kinds of assets that we're using to communicate science, but zines are super old. Um, one of the first zines was created in the 1930s, um, and it's a sci-fi zine. And there are a whole bunch of sci-fi zines created in that time, and then evolved where the punk scene in the UK and in the US used zines to review music, to encourage each other, and, and publicize shows. And it was a huge part of this punk counterculture community. And then we have, in the 1990s, all of these feminist zines, you must have heard of Riot Girl, Bust, Bitch, all these started as zines. These zines gave a voice to the people who were not part of the dominant voice in, in culture at the time. And so as long as you can print something, you can make a zine. A lot of times they're low cost or free. Um, they're made in small batches. There's uncensored, there's no gatekeepers, and they, they really focus on the specific topics that people are really passionate about. You can put anything you want in a zine. And now today, there are zines about everything, about race, art, sex, gender, anything you can think of. Someone has probably made a zine about it, and I highly encourage you to go to any zine fest that you can, that you can attend. They're very inspiring places. Every single person has a story to tell, and they just put in a book for you, and it costs like $2, $5, $10, and you can really engage with the most vulnerable um, and inaccessible parts of people by, by looking at the art that they choose to create. So um, zines are really great for science communication, as I've learned, but there weren't really a lot of them out there. Um, here are a handful of zines that I've seen um, attending zine fests. And um, there was one, the Small Science Collection, I think was actually out of Brown University. And I, don't, I think it's no longer um, uh, continued on, but you can see that these are just like small pieces of paper. And I actually have a bunch of zines here, um, and Julia can just kind of stack out and you can flip through them. And um, I'll need these back at the end of the session, so if at the end of the session you can just place them back on the table, that would be great. But you can see how um, there's so many different kinds of zines throughout my journey in there. There's some from the very first time that we've made zines. Um, oops, it's a little unaligned, but uh, Tara Johnson is a scientist that I met at University of Oregon in 2012 because we were both doing a, uh, an REU, so just doing summer research. Uh, at Eugene, Oregon, and um, we stayed connected. We, she was probably like one of the only people that I knew that did um, science research as an undergrad and also really loved to create art. Um, and we just had so much in common, so we wanted to stay in touch. And you know, we have tons of people holding us accountable in our research and in our jobs, but we had no one to hold, us, hold each other accountable to make art. So we became that person for each other, and it started with just these few pieces of paper on this table um, in 2015, and some of the zines that are going around are um, the ones that we created in the very beginning. And you can see they're very flimsy. We printed them um, either at Staples or um, just at home, but some of them are risograph printed. Some of them were printed by New England Biolabs after they commissioned us to make a zine for them. So, you know, a zine could just be one piece of paper. There's one that it, that's called How to Be a Scientist. That's really just one piece of letter paper cut and folded. Or it can be a 20-page um, risograph printed zine. So really, it can be anything. And um, after we created these together, we started collaborating with other scientists and artists. And um, we've collaborated with tons of different people and have been able to um, look at the work that we do from a little bit of a different perspective just by working with fellow scientists or fellow artists um, or working with companies to, to deliver the messages that they want to deliver. Um, but another thing that happened when we went to these zine fests is that we're part of this counterculture of kind of like indie artists, and a lot of them wear these really cool pins. And on the left is this pin that, one of the first pins I bought, it's of a sloth, and it says, nap all day, sleep all night, party never. And that just resonated with me so much. I was like, I've never felt so represented in an object before. Um, and I was like, okay, I have that for my jacket now. I sleep all day, or sleep all night, nap all day, party never. Um, but I also want something that's science-y, you know? Because I'm also a scientist, and I want to put that on my jacket too. But there was, wasn't really anything out there. And so we started making them. And another thing that I noticed at these zine fests is that people who don't have accreditation or a degree or a major never see themselves as scientists. And this was touched on in the session earlier today. So we made these patches 
that say scientists, and I sell them at every zine fest that I go to because I want someone to come up to me and say, oh, well, you know, I love science, but I'm not a scientist. I'm like, you are a scientist. How many liquid eyeliners did you test out before you found the one that gave you exactly what you needed? You know, how, how many experiments have you done in your life? How many times did you grow crops in rows versus, you know, on a, on a, a railing or I don't know, whatever you call them, terrace? Um, but everyone is a scientist. Everyone engages in the scientific method. They just don't necessarily have that title. And I'm here to give them that title because we're all scientists. And also, you know, you're all artists, too. Um, I'm going to touch on that a little bit more later, but everyone has science that they can share in their own creative way. Um, but a beautiful thing that happened out of creating these brain pins for neuroscientists, um, creating these pipette pins, and we actually only started making them um, in brown and this kind of tannish yellow because I was like, I'm here to represent myself, you know? Like, the rest of the world has been out there representing themselves, and I'm here to do my job, and no one has really complained about that yet, which is great. <laughs> But um, the pins, I've heard some amazing stories. You know, people put them on the backpack. These are, uh, the text is small, so I'll read some of them. So the one on the very left is um, a tweet by Dr. Jess Wade, who is amazing. I highly recommend everyone follow her on Twitter, at Jess Wade. Um, but she uh, tweeted, a little girl just spent our whole journey on the tube, parentheses for the American subway, reading all of my badges. We spoke about NASA and NASA JPL. She especially liked Christine Lou Art's Hello World, so I gave it to her in exchange for her promise to become a scientist. So this is, uh, you know, a, a PhD scientist taking the subway, and she just, uh, no, a little girl just was able to meet the scientist and talk about her passion and talk about, talk to a scientist. And this really, like the, the patch, the pins, they, I think are playing a small role in upending the stereotype of who is a scientist or not. Because I walk into a room, people look at me and they, oh, maybe, maybe they'll think I'm an artist, but they never think I'm a scientist, especially when my hair is more blue. So <laughs> I might not be what they look like, what they think a scientist looks like, but I am a scientist. And maybe I have to wear things that make people realize that I'm a scientist, but I think bit by bit, you know, expressing our, our identity that we are scientists can help change even just a little way. You know, I see some brain pins out here, and, and, like, and I've even heard from Kirsten that people have come up to her and asked her, like, what's all about this brain pin? And that, and that sparks science communication in the wild. You know, it doesn't even have to be intentional. Um, oops. There was a problem, and it's closed. Um, I don't really, you. yeah, you can you. figure it keep out. Talking, keep yeah. talking, keep um, There we go. So um, just if, I was just gonna show a few more, a few more tweets about, um, how people use this uh, to express not just their science identity, but other identities that are import to, important to them as they navigate the science world. So there's this, another great pin maker. Um, their Twitter is Yas Petit Poulet, and they create these pins, these little chemistry pins, um, that allow people to express their L LGBTQ plus identities or their identity as an ally. So um, here's a tweet um, from Dr. Axel Yale Birnbaum and says, I now wear Yas Petit Poulet's hashtag queer chemistry A L and B I on me every day since some staff members and postdocs have approached me to talk, seeing me as a walking safe zone at the lab. One person stands out to me in particular because they are quite senior and yet never came out. So these are tiny, tiny acts of resistance, but I think together they all add up to change the perception of who can do science from people who are not scientists, but who can do science within science the science community itself. Um, and so I think what we need to do is to empower trusted scientists in their chosen niches. So every single person here, you do more than one thing. You do more than what your job title is. You enter these different spaces all the time. I am a scientist. I spend a lot of time doing scientific research, but I also really love education and art and design. And there are scientists who do yoga all the time, who cook all the time, who love fashion. And we, we should bring science to all these other parts of our lives, and we should empower people or channel the, the power that these people have to bring science where they go. And so these other extra dots are places where education might happen in a classroom, or where art and design might happen in a fine art gallery, but oh, what we need to do is to focus on where the scientists actually are and where they're trusted and provide resources to really enhance the work that we can do in those spaces, the spaces where we don't have to work to try to become a trusted person, but where we're already seen as, as a resource and as a trusted member. So um, Two Photon Art was bootstrapped from about $50. 
Um, and we were able to start using just, you know, a few pieces of paper at Staples to, to who we are now, like making enamel pins all the time. Um, but we needed to pass that power on. So um, thank you everyone who's bought a pin from me because we've taken that money and we've been able to not just, you know, say, oh, you know, we love, um, like inclusive science communication, but we just do our own thing. No, we, we, we find people who are in those communities and can do that work and we give them money. We, we pass on the power that we have and, and really enable people to, to reach communities that we can't reach because I would love to create information on how to deal with um, being disabled in STEM, but I don't know what that's like. I'm not going to pretend and take on an identity that I don't have and, you know, hello fellow kids, you know, and just pretend like I'm part of this community when I don't and when I'm an outsider. So you give money to people who can do that work. And so Gabi Serrato Marx, she's actually speaking in another session now, so you should also follow her on Twitter um, and you should watch her video series that she's done. And she created this video series, she's, she applied to our small grant fund um, because she looked on YouTube and there was no one else doing, making a video series on this. Just like how when I tried to find pins for myself to wear, no one else had made them. So the more marginalized you are, the more different you are, the more you're alone in STEM, the more space you have to do something new that can really impact other people. Like we always talk about being pushed off to the side as a huge disadvantage because it is, but also these people are, are at the frontier. You know, The more marginalized, the more pushed off to the side you are, the more space you have to grow. And I think we really need to focus on finding these people and giving them the power and not just saying like, oh, okay, we need black students to go to black classrooms. <clears throat> we find black students and ask them, what would you do if I just gave you $100 and give them the $100? We don't try to take people and put them where we want to see them, but we find people and give them what they want and give them space to grow. So um, we're always thinking about like, how do we build bridges and bring people together and push these resources here and there, but don't do that. Just be a bridge. Bring science wherever you go. Bring your other identities into science. Bridge these communities. Don't just try to build things and then move on and build another one. Um, and identify trusted communicators with their, their full humanity and existing experience and just give them the resources that they need. There are tons of money in this world, you know, just share it with the people who could use it a little more and um, really focus on, on people who are doing work that you cannot do, that has not been done, that has never been done and will not be done unless you empower these people. So a lot of this takes a lot of risk taking and creativity and, and staying afraid and doing it anyway. So a lot of this is going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be new, you might not have any role models, but that's the importance of coming together and doing all this new stuff together and trading tips and empowering each other. You know, I don't have any credentials in this space, but yet people believe in me and yet people continue to support. So I think not only do we need to take risks, we need to invest in people who are taking risks. So um, I have a ton of people that I would like to acknowledge, including the people who make this art with me, but my, my lab community, my science community, the people in my life, my grandma who feeds me bitter melon, um, <laughs> but also the online science communication com community. I would not be here if it, if it were not my loud mouth on Twitter, I don't think. And I would not be happy if it were not all the people who, who kept encouraging me all this time because this has been said before, but um, when you, you, you can have diversity, but that just means you put a bunch of people who don't belong in a, in a place and you try to say, okay, you're here now, you must, be, you must belong. But without inclusion, diversity is just faces feeling alone and isolated. And so I was feeling very, very isolated until I found my community and that, you know, my community was just online. And so if you're not on the internet yet, get on the internet. I mean, that's where a lot of this magic happens because the more marginalized you are, the less people there are who are like you, but the magic happens is when you find each other. And that's like in this room at this conference. So participate and encourage each other and support each other, and we can just do some amazing things together. So thank you for your time.